Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, let me welcome everyone to the TU Delft Library. My name is Vincent Salucci. I'm a program maker behind the New No Lenses program and the Lenslessness exhibition uh, that's to your left. Uh, if uh, you haven't gotten a chance to check that out, I would invite you to uh, look at it uh, before or after. Just out of curiosity, was anyone at the opening reception for the, that or the artist performance? A few people? Was anyone at both? All right, all right. <laughs> I recognize my friend here. Um, well, great, fantastic. Uh, today is, let's say, uh, the third stop on our program tour, um, and I'm very excited about it because when we're conceiving uh, of this event, um, you know, we have all this wonderful imagery that uh, Lorenz and uh, Carbon have uh, helped me curate uh, and curated themselves uh, for the, the, the TU Delft community uh, behind uh, their research at QTech, um, but also, you know, learning and testing these, uh, 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 including testing these nano devices and qubits. Um, and so they made the link between Raul here, who's gonna give today's lecture, uh, and the Kevli Nano Lab, uh, who's actually manufacturing these devices here on campus. And uh, when we were conceiving of this event, I got very excited because I was, you know, sort of talking to the guys and, and, and talking with Rod and sort of saying, okay, well, what's this like quantum internet and quantum computing and qubits, all these things are so, sort of super abstract, at least to the general uh, layperson such as myself. Um, but then, you know, these guys are actually handling the material science behind uh, this quantum computing and quantum uh, internet. And so my, my tagline for the, the, the goal for the event was like, this is as close as you can come to touching uh, quantum computers and quantum internets if you're not in these specialty labs. So hopefully we deliver on that today because uh, after Roald's uh, his talk here, uh, we're going to adjourn uh, to this table in the back uh, for those of you that are interested and we'll try to, you know, be uh, considerate of uh, having people look at it or not, but we actually brought quite a few samples um, of some of these chips that you can see. Um, and really also to help explain uh, why you see such beautiful patterns um, in some of this, uh, in the ex exhibition. So I think that's enough talk for me. I am gonna formally introduce uh, our speaker. Uh, so give me one moment, please. Roald van der Kolk is a process engineer at the Kevli Nanolab within the Department of Quantum Nanoscience at the TU Delft. He is a clean room educator and he teaches students on topics such as ellipsometry, reflectometry, plasma physics, and much more. All right, Roald, take hey. it away. Yes, is this audible? Am I, is it okay? Yeah, perfect, right. Well, welcome to the lecture. Um, the lecture, I'm gonna divide it up in two parts, beholding a quantum chip and building a quantum chip, like completely sort of different topics. So the first half of this lecture is just us staring us for 15 minutes at this image. No, <laughs> jokes aside, uh, it is always a very special moment in the lab when, when you encounter something like this. Now to you, it may seem like something very aesthetic, but to us, this is a major incident. The, the thing is completely imploded died in and on itself, and it's a horrible thing to see. But you still stare at it for quite some time. Um, <laughs> but of course, we're looking at something here, and we now have no clue what we're looking at. So we probably need to build on this a bit. Like, what are we really looking at? What, what do we see right now? So why do chips look so nice? Uh, there, are, there are all these amazing aesthetics in chips, and we'll see more and more uh, in the Hotel and during the lecture, but you, you have these weird shapes that pop up in chips. For instance, what you see here is actually one layer crumbling away from another layer and forming a beautiful Christmas tree by, as a byproduct. Then, of course, we narrowed it down to what are we actually looking at. So the aesthetics in nanotechnology is, is mainly two things. Uh, we have uh, microscopy optical microscopy and scanning electron microscopy. Those look generally the most aesthetic. We do, of course, have other ways to actually see the atoms, like transmission electron microscopy or scanning tunneling microscopy, uh, but they generally don't give these super aesthetic images because it's really repeating patterns and you throw a color map at it. Then, of course, you have atomic force microscopy, which shows you the surface of an object, but it's not as pretty as seeing the 3D object. So that's what we see. But what is there to see? 
Now, most of you would have seen the Intel logo, but what you might not know is that the Intel logo actually hides you a small part of the actual chip. So if you <laughs> remove your cap from a CPU, this is what you would actually see. And what is there to see? We can sort of separate it in a few categories, right? We see some metallic hue, and metallic layers up to five nanometer thickness, like a countable amount of atoms, we can still see that sort of metallic. Then there are some colors, and where do these colors come from? That's, of course, one of these questions. And we have our patterns, our lithography, right? Uh, the things that are there. Right. So the colors. Like, to you, this now looks like a rainbow. To me, it looks like a very small slope. So to me, this looks like a slope. That's a fascinating thing. So why does it look like a slope to me and a rainbow to you? So in physics, we have this effect called thin film interference. Right. So imagine I throw two stones in water and these waves will form these patterns. And if you have two upstanding waves, you can add them together. And if you have an upstanding wave and a lower wave or a valley, they will be, they will be destructed or they will lower. So if you have a very thin layer on top of something that's reflecting, uh, uh, which is basically, for instance, here, we have a thin layer. So the actual color of this material is transparent. But it would be strange, because why does it look like this? So every wavelength, every color of light uh, has a physical size. And because these films are so thin in the order of magnitude of the size of light, uh, we have these interference effects that affect what we see. So reality, we're looking at something that is transparent on top of something that is silver, but because we have this interference effect, it ends up with a single color. Right. So what, how do I build up to a stairwell, staircase or a very long slope? Basically, this is the thinnest region where we don't see anything at all. This is out of the size of uh, light. And then we get closer to where we are in the size of light. And all of a sudden, a specific wavelength uh, gets destructed or a specific set of wavelengths get constructively interfered and we get a particular color. <laughs> so the color is a thickness effect. But it is not a real color. It's not the material doesn't have this color. It is because of these thin layers. But you see this effect all around. If you put two microscope slides on top of each other, you would see these rainbow effects too. And as a matter of fact, nanotechnology, of course, is everywhere. Uh, so we might do it in our labs, but you would see it all around you. For instance, oil on top of water is also a very thin layer. So you have the same effect. So you can guess there's 50 nanometers of oil here, maybe 100 here, and it gets thicker towards this point. Some animals actually do this. Some of the colors are not really the colors, but are these thin film effects. So, for instance, butterflies have this. And they can create these really vibrant colors because we're actually also constructively interfering some colors. You can also have it if you have two pieces of glass with air in between, like the microscope slide. So let's say some construct of a glass window. Or in the case what we have in our labs a lot is a metal and a metal oxide. So if your pan has some metal oxide, if it's very thin, you would also see these rainbow patterns. So these type of rainbow patterns you would see everywhere. Even, for instance, for quenching steel, you can guess the thickness by how hot this has been, which is basically the oxide thickness. And remember, this thickness tells you the color, right? So, right, so this, this is a beautiful aesthetic. But in practice, we can also use this. So, for instance, if it's, let's say, a silicon dioxide wafer, we could guess the thickness in nanometers based on the color because this effect was very thickness dependent. Of course, this light also has a size, and the size of light is its color. So I have a bit of a mini quiz. So you can actually win one of, one of the wafers. So this wafer is winnable, but you'll have to guess the thickness. And uh, uh, if someone would like to, the next slide will, give, will be the hint, if you could maybe have this go around. And of course, of course, there, there's, there's scientists who made a paper where you can basically take a photo, get the RGB color code, and then you get the thickness of a layer in nanometer accuracy. It's always done like that. I love that. So this is the hint. A quick, good look. Here you can guess the thickness. So we have the wafer, and we have our color spectrum. So this one is maybe the artist here have, will have an advantage. 
uh, you can try to guess what thickness this wafer is, and you can write it down on a piece of paper. And the one who gets closest wins the wafer. Now, the cool thing about this, this particular wafer is this silicon and then silicon nitride. And this silicon is in a diamond lattice. So it is a diamond crystal. And it's a nearly perfect crystal. If you accidentally drop it, it will likely break in a straight line because the atomic, uh, because it is actually completely aligned straight to the atom. So you see there is a chip on the side, and the atoms are actually in that direction. So it will break either in this direction or the straight direction there. It was fascinating that we can build things on such precision. Like most atoms in that thing are where we want them to be. Right. So now uh, it's up to guessing. Right. So coming back to this image, right? So color is thickness. So this is mainly blue. So this is mainly, in this case, I think it's about 100 nanometers. So what we see mainly here is 100 nanometers. Then we see these black regions, which are thinner, and we see some rainbows. So what we see is something that's really crumpled up under stress. And we see a lot of that in the art exhibition as well. So why it is so aesthetic is because it's a thin film that's crumpled up due to stress, which is, of course, not a thing you want if you want to make some device, then it is a negative effect. But that is what we really see. And it produces these beautiful organic shapes. I mean, you think it's abstract art, but it's just, just, just an accident. <laughs> um, so quite ironically, usually what you do not want is the most aesthetic. Uh, I love this one. This looks, looks to me like a Starry Night by Van Gogh. But really, it is just uh, the acid residues that haven't cleaned up perfectly. So this is some residues that you really don't want. But then, of course, you see it under the microscope, and you see it as beautiful as this. Now, there is a hint that it's very thin, because we see some rainbows, right? And with rainbows, generally, we can talk about very thin layers. So that is what we see. Right. Now, there is one other category of rainbow effect. So in chips, there are sort of two types of rainbows, and this chip uh, accidentally had both. So there's also a thing called a diffraction grating. I will not go into the physics too much, but basically if you have a very small repeating pattern, uh, let's think about transistors, something like that, right? So a chip, I have all these small patterns, and these also can produce a rainbows. They actually reflect a particular wavelength, but if it's a bit of a poor grating, you might see more colors. <laughs> so here we see thin film interference with these bright colors, and here we have a grating. So modern chips, you, why do they look pretty? It's mainly because of these two effects. So you have thin film interference and you have gratings, which are byproducts of what we're making. So another rainbow, where does the rainbow come from? Is, of course, if you have, um, uh, if you have your CD, CD discs, that rainbow actually comes from a grating effect because we have these small patterns, which are the yes and no's on our CD disc. And that is why we see a rainbow there. So that's another rainbow. So the thin film rainbow and the grating rainbow. Might also be interesting to see this. You can actually do some quite cool effect, uh, experiments with a CD disc. If you isolate the light, you could see, for instance, that a TL only has three colors instead of a full range of a spectrum. Right. So going a little bit more towards quantum computing. So currently, with quantum computing, we are in the order of magnitude of a countable amount of bits. <coughs> so the aesthetics of, I argue, the aesthetics of a good quantum chip are not that pretty yet, right? Because the lithographies are rather large, and we don't have these large repeating patterns, so we don't have these grating effects as much. And usually, only one color because of one layer. So modern chips, we have basically these grating effects and thin film effects, which cause them to be very aesthetic, and successfully aesthetic, not as a byproduct of an accident. Okay, so that was the aesthetics of it, but then how do we build a quantum chip? So I work in the clean room of the Calvin Analog, and we walk around in all sorts of these suits. Um, uh, there is actually a virtual tour, if you're interested, uh, there's the link, and you can walk around in our clean room if you're just curious, like, how does an environment like that look like? Because we're all in these weird suits. Uh, the link is very hard to find, but worst case, just email me, Google my name, and you can find it. So why would we have these suits? 
Could anyone guess that is not uh, in, in the lab already? <laughs> Why would we walk around in these weird suits? Perfect, yeah, exactly, to avoid dust. Because, of course, we're working on the nanometer scale. A uh, normal dust particle is usually already a micron. So if there's a dust particle in the way, the, it will be a short or part of your device doesn't work. So we have to uh, avoid dust. So these suits are basically to protect the environment from us as we are dust machines. I mean, if you, if you go into your living room, for some reason, dust keeps on accumulating. It has to come from somewhere. And unfortunately, we are the main culprit here. Uh, so that's why we're in all these suits. Also, the <coughs> we, were, we also work very, in very experimental environments with a lot of hazardous materials, a lot of lethal gases, explosives. So we, some, some of us also walk around in these suits on the occasion uh, because we do, to create all these things, you do work in a very dangerous environment. So that's part of the suits. Right. So what might also be interesting to know, like uh, you may have, might have heard uh, like of companies of Intel or ASML, uh, TNO maybe, uh, those, or Microsoft, those might be familiar names to you. And it might be interesting to know that our humble clean room in Delft uh, houses all these great companies and places. But of course, uh, in quantum computing, there's also already companies coming up. Like it might seem like a very far remote abstract thing, but for instance, uh, uh, Quantware <laughs> in the back uh, is, is already commercially selling quantum chips, which is, uh, which is really fascinating. It's really starting to uh, set off. Okay, right, so we have a clean room. We, we walk in these silly suits, but what do we actually do here? Uh, so nanofabrication, right? So you're building small stuff in a nutshell, right? So here we have some SEM images and uh, all these tiny things, they have certain effects like nanopillars, they have weird effects with light. Uh, sometimes you have micro mechanical devices, so you can literally build cogs or uh, moving objects in the small. But how do you get from there to a quantum device? So in a nutshell, narrowing it down, building these things is actually quite simple. There's only a few processes which we really do. We have additive processes by growing something, which can be very simple. Like you, you, you melt a metal, the vapor comes off, and you very uniformly grow nanometers of this metal layer. You could do it with chemical reactions, which is, of course, the reason why we also have the fireman suits. We do a lot of chemistry. Uh, we do also a lot with plasma. Plasma pulls apart atoms and makes it easy to react on the surface because we have them in a sort of very free state. We can build things from it. Uh, and then, of course, the other way around, reductive. We also want to remove something. So we could etch with plasma or etch with ion beams, etch with chemicals, and we remove stuff. Well, that way you only go up and down, but you don't get a pattern. So, of course, the most important part is lithography, right? So you might have heard of ASML, the reason why the Netherlands exists. <laughs> Right? It's our most powerful asset. Uh, so that is one way. Then you do it with light, and you selectively break some polymer bonds, and you throw some chemical at it, and somewhere the polymer stays, somewhere the polymer doesn't stay. You end up with a pattern. And then you can do some additive or reductive steps to create some structure. And there are some qualitative things. You can change the properties of it. You can create crystals. You can remove crystals. You can change doping or electrical behavior. Right. But how do we put that into practice? So this was actually from my bachelor thesis. We made these micro ring resonators. Very silly thing. Uh, basically, you can couple a light wave into it. And because it has a particular length, only certain waves of light are allowed to propagate in there. Again, it's sort of similar to the thin film interference, if you really think about it. So how do you build something like that? We start with some sample, which has a buried oxide layer, some different layer. We throw in some polymer, this e-beam resist. We expose with an electron beam, but yeah, you could also do it with light or some other method, and we expose some pattern. We throw some chemicals at it, and where we broke these polymer bonds, uh, the, the pattern will have gone. And then we do some etch, and we remove material. And oh, a few steps further along the way, and we end up with this sort of micro ring disk. So basically, it is all very simple steps. You either do a full layer, you do some selective process yeah, with an e-beam, or you, you remove a layer. And in these simple steps, you can build all sorts of wonder structures. You are somewhat limited by what you can create. Uh, so there are quite some challenges in nanofabrication to build more complex 3D structures. 
So that's why I think most qubits you see now are generally 2D or sort of a few, only a few layer type of chips. Uh, but in future, of course, we will see more complicated shapes. Uh, for a transistor, very long process, but like for a transistor, it's just the same as this, just a lot of different steps, uh, but basically with the same sort of building blocks. Huh? So the transistors, the things that are in your phone, are also similar processes, just the sets of steps, either uh, additive, uh, reductive, or selective. So how does actually our normal mass production chip look like? So if I look at my phone, what, what's going on? So we start with this silicon. So this is sort of silvery looking material. Uh, and we have this process called the Krasowski process. And we are able to make near perfect crystals, which is ridiculous, like a, a perfect crystal that size. That <laughs> means every atom in that thing is at the exact location where we want it to be. I mean, if you breathe in the direction of it, it's already contaminated, like beyond use. Like it's, it's that perfect. Right, so we cut out slices of these, and that's actually what you see here. So that's for part of the prize. So this is a slice of that. And now you notice, this looks very silvery, right? So that is, originally this was that silvery color, but because we have a very thin layer, right, which is transparent, we have this thin film interference, and it ends up with this beautiful pinkish hue. Right, so then, when we go to our modern wafers, we do all these processes. And basically, of course, uh, you want to produce multiple chips on one wafer, uh, less expensive. So for instance, here we have a semi-modern chip. So we see all these colorful squares. And each of those squares, we will saw out with a diamond blade. And that's a single chip, for instance, for your cell phone or a microcontroller. Then, of course, if you have a single chip like that, you still need to make it connect to the rest of your phone, otherwise you can't press a button and nothing would happen. So we do a thing called wire bonding, where we connect with a sort of larger size to the small chip. So that's how the chip communicates with the rest. And then you can put a hood on it, put it in the CPU or put it whatever. So this is actually visually what happens in your pocket. Right. Okay, so then how does this small thing become quantum, right? Because we haven't touched on quantum yet. Uh, because now we have done regular computing. So first I would have to do, I'm gonna do quantum physics in five minutes, which is my favorite thing. <laughs> first you have to explain a little bit about the regular bit, just for context, right? So a regular bit, you could consider it sort of a yes or no question. Uh, I, could get, I could sort of communicate a letter of the alphabet if I just say, well, W is yes, no, yes, 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 right? So there's a unique sort of code for every letter of the alphabet. So I could communicate a letter of the alphabet in yes or no questions. And this is where I, I love quantum computing because now the entire alphabet is a single yes or no question. <coughs> All right, so allow me to explain it a bit. So a regular bit is yes or a no. And in a quantum bit, without explaining the physics behind it, we can imagine it not as a single up yes or down no, but sort of any direction. And that direction is like a little bit of yes, a little bit of no. And ignoring complex numbers, but let's say we, we say E is, well, 16% yes and 84% no. You can sort of address every letter of the alphabet as how much yes and no at the same time you would want it to be. <clears throat> so that creates a very sort of complicated thing, but in in, in fact, you know, there's an infinite amount of information, in theory, uh, <laughs> inside of a single qubit, which is sort of one of the cool properties of qubits. Right, so we've had now something very abstract, but how do we make it? Because apparently we need some, uh, some state that is yes and some state that is no that have this weird behavior. Uh, so one way of doing this is with what we call a Joseph's injunction. It's fun that it's already, it's predicted in 1962, right? So before we get even to building these things, we were many years further, right? So, so many years down the line, and we already had quantum computing apparently in 1962, in theory. Uh, building these things is not necessarily so easy. Um, yes, so in a nutshell, we have a, let's go to the next slide, I think that will be a bit easier. Uh, in a nutshell, we need, Three materials, we need a, for, for this Joseph's injunction, we need a superconductor, we need some barrier, and we need another superconductor. 
then we have built these states. Uh, the physics, I mean, might be a bit difficult to explain in a short time. But then, how does the Joseph's injection look like in real life? It's a very simple and elegant thing. So we have one superconductor on top of another superconductor and a bit of oxide in between. Right, so that is very easy to build. Then why is quantum computing so difficult? Well, the problem is you also need to communicate to it. And generally speaking, when you communicate to it, you directly destroy it. So you need to resonate with it with some form of way. So the simple quantum chip is not just our transmon qubit. It's also some way to communicate to it. Uh, so actually, we have actually some chips from Quantware where you can actually see these devices. And this is just a lot of qubits at once, but then you can see physically the qubit. So they're a little bit um, simple in a way, but also very complicated because a normal bit, you can interact with it quite easily, whereas a quantum bit, the interaction is a bit more difficult. Right, uh, any further questions? And I hope you enjoyed the, this brief tour of uh, building and beholding a qubit. Questions? We have to use this device. <laughs> Not exactly a quantum device, but it's a little bulkier. All right. Break the ice. So, uh, for a person who wants to get into quantum computing, what would you say are the, let's say, main science topics you would need to have a good grasp of? That's a good point. So there's really two worlds. I mean, uh, for instance, nanofabrication is a completely different world than uh, developing, developing the algorithms. Uh, you could really stay away from laboratories very far if you want to. Uh, there's also really different expertises. Of course, also to most of the qubits, we use these dilution refrigerators, which is already like a completely different world uh, of working, right? Because you need to cool them down a lot. Uh, and that is a very difficult technique by itself. But generally, so depends on what your interests are. Are you more into the algorithm side or more into the physics side? Like I say, the material science side is more if you're interested in researching new qubits, whereas the algorithm and the, the, the sort of more the mathematical side is more if you want to do actual working with quantum computers. Because I think you're seeing more specialization already. I think in QTEC you already have a lot of people who are just in the lab or just in the fab <laughs> fabrication. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of choices there. But of course you would need a lot of uh, heavy mathematics, like a good linear, good linear algebra understanding, good understanding of complex numbers, so complex analysis. Uh, and some knowledge of computing is very important too. Uh, because quantum computing is just a lot more difficult to understand, even from basic computing. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask about this picture again. Ah, yeah. You said something imploded, but yeah, like I still can't wrap my head. Can you just explain a little bit more about what actually happened? Yeah. Ah, so this is actually quite interesting. So this is a sample for biology, uh, per sheer irony, because most of the chips actually look similar. But uh, so microfluidics, so. Uh, let's say uh, you, uh, you want to transfer a single DNA molecule or something like that, or you can use DNA actually as a hard drive because it's more stable than regular hard drives, per sheer irony. And uh, this was a project where we were, they were making, Nimo André from the University of Leiden, thank him for this picture, by the way. Um, he was making these microfluidic channels, and these channels, yeah, <coughs> they imploded. Uh, and materials, they have this stress, so uh, sometimes, Due to stress, a layer might de-adhere. So actually, we have this orange layer here and this uh, rainbow stuff, right? It's in film interference. And the orange layer started to delaminate. So actually, what you see in big or in small there, because it's a microscope image, we see now in the big, a large layer that's starting to delaminate. But if you zoom in, it, was, it would be wrinkling like this, depending on whether the stresses pull it inward or outward, tensile or compressive stresses. Fun question. <laughs> Um, okay, so a couple of slides back here. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of slides back, you said that interacting with the system kind of destroys it. What do you mean by that? What is salvaged, what is lost? I, I mean, that would require like, uh, the, the explanation of the quantum state, right? Uh, for instance, uh, a particle that is in a quantum state is in the entire universe at once, right? It is m statistically mostly where you expect it to be. But then if you interact with it by some form or way, like you throw a photon at it, it is forced to choose a position, which is the collapse of the state. Uh, 
uh, which is like the most fundamental thing about quantum physics. Which is really cool, because of course, it is spread around the entire universe. And there are so ways to abuse it, right? So we have the quantum teleportation experiment lying under Delft, which abuses this phenomena in a way, uh, where you sort of make a quantum state of two particles, you pull them apart, but they're still the same thing, so they will interact immediately. And they could transfer some information, because let's say there's some conservation, right? So let's say, you know, uh, there's a spin, let's say we have spin, up and down, and we know that it needs to be conserved, so if I measure up here, it needs to be down there. But that could be at any distance. So you could teleport, in this case, the information. Mm. Which is, unfortunately, not an easy answer. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but so in that way, uh, if you want to use these quantum properties, you cannot sort of interact with it directly, because it then forces to choose. Because when I said something about like 20% uh, one or 80% zero, really that's the chance of it going to a one or a zero. Because if you interact with it, it becomes a regular bit, choosing to be one or zero. But the information is in the quantum state, in when it's still not interacted with. So it kind of takes away its randomness? Yes, exactly. Well, because it becomes classical okay. uh, once you engage with it. And that randomness, that weirdness, that has the cool properties. All right, thank you. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, hello, I'd like to ask, uh, can, I, can we just use uh, normal precise to fabricate uh, the quantum chips? Use a normal chip precise. Uh, normal chip design? Yeah, use a normal chip precise to, to fabricate the quantum way, some uh, simple quantum chips like that. Uh, sorry, sorry, if you couldn't understand, do you? Yeah. Process, oh, normal process. Yes, yeah, so the process to making a quantum chip is not much more complicated in a way than making a regular chip. So for instance, with the Josephson junction you saw, this is a really sort of easy thing to fabricate. Oh. It's a evaporation of a metal. So you heat up some metal by whatever method, uh, and it gets stuck to some uh, region. It forms a metal layer, and we do this twice in a nutshell, and we have the behavior that we need. It turns out that that metal is a superconductor, but it, aluminum is a superconductor. So it's not really that those are super ridiculous, rare, special materials. No, not at all. We make it of silicon, which is based on sand, and aluminum, which you're all very familiar with. And then we're already at the quantum level. So yeah, that's a good question, actually, because you might think, oh, these are very exotic, rare, unique materials. But no, they're all around us. Uh, yeah, so I was wondering, how can you make the qubit useful if you're not really able to interact with it without it collapsing? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really good question. Can the qubit useful without really interacting? Mm, it's how you use the qubit. But I would say uh, Gerben or uh, our colleagues from quantum computing who are more specialized on that part of the physics could maybe better answer it. Right now? Yeah, if you want to. This microphone might be on. On the spot. <laughs> test, test. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's a difficult question. Uh, if you want to learn more, I would advise taking a uh, master in physics or, uh, <laughs> or something. But um, yeah, so they just work in a completely different way as normal bits, and uh, they have some kind of special properties like superposition and entanglement, which normal bits don't have. And that's together with some other things. Um, gives them the ability to interact in um, cool ways that allows certain algorithms to solve questions much quicker than classical computing. And with classical computing, I just mean zero and ones. Yeah. So you can run special algorithms on them, but you need many. So a single bit is not that interesting, but you need, yeah. let's say, 10,000 or a million qubits to do some interesting stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, one of those classical examples, I mean, if you have a sort of perfect quantum bit, right, it's like the, the equivalent computing power. Like, let's say you have 100 qubits, that's the equivalent computing power of making every atom in the known universe a regular bit, if you get them to work properly, which we unfortunately know that, and there's some limitations, but that's the theory, uh, right? Also, remember that a single quantum bit, in principle, has an infinite amount of information. So there are some weird things uh, with it. 
But yeah, the interacting with qubits is actually a very, very in-depth topic. It's uh, very difficult, but it's fun. Thanks. Uh, so I have a question. In normal computing, bits are uh, current flowing, where if there is a current, it's a one. If there is no current, it's a zero. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How are the quantum states represented physically? Like, is it a special physical property that is changed? Ah, yeah. Well, you can see it in a lot of different ways. So, for instance, a current flowing, you could say there's a potential energy of five volt and zero volt, right? And now we have a superposition of these two, <laughs> two states. Uh, but you could also, you, there's, there's some complexities with these imagining, right? So in quantum physics, it's not a weird thing for an object to annihilate itself. So because you can be at two places at the same time, you can also hit yourself, ironically. So things are a little bit more complicated. Um, but do realize every time it interacts, it is simply a zero or five volts. So in a way, you could get that output but when you're not interacting with it, there's something weird going on. Might not be an easy answer, but I hope that helps. <laughs> and we'll make the full question circuit and end it here. <laughs> <laughs> so I was wondering, because um, a qubit can have a certain percentage of yes and a certain percentage of no, mm -hmm. and couldn't it theoretically represent an infinite number of amount of states? So for example, you have a yes, zero point, I don't know, zero, zero, 10,000 times one, yes, and then um, it's complement as a no. Exactly, exactly. In, in, so in theory, there's a that yes. In theory, in principle, you could say hey, the, it's 0 0.00001 percent yes, right? So you could sort of grab a, throw an infinite amount of information in there. In practice, it becomes a bit more difficult because, of course, how do you extract the information from it? So there's two problems there. So in quantum, we have the non-cloning theorem. So that single state that has this infinite amount of information cannot be cloned. And once it collapses, there's a percentual chance you get yes or no. So it's small chance, right, of 0 0.01. Yes, let's say there's a very small chance of yes. But it could pop to a yes. So basically, if you can prepare this state, uh, so you could prepare it in some state that has this representation, uh, and you collapse that state, you get a random chance. So if you repeat this long enough, you can get all the information from how accurately you prepare that state. But the problem is, how accurately can you prepare that state? Which is a bit of the, the challenge. So maybe in future we can do this more accurately and accurately. Uh, but there's a lot of sort of practical complications. Because they're also very unstable, right? So we put them in dilution refrigerators, which are cooled to near absolute zero, because uh, vibration or temperature is noise. So let's say we have a motion state, like it, temperature is noise to it. So we need to cool it to nearly absolute zero. And then still, it only survives for microseconds or milliseconds if you're in the good type of qubit. OK, thank you. All right, well, please join me in thanking Raul for taking his time out today to educate us a little bit more about qubits and quantum device manufacturing, uh -huh. nanofacturing. And the, uh, the we, prize handout. Yes, ah, let's yeah. do the prize. Can I get all the forms? Uh, forms? I'll help collect. I, yeah, perfectly, with the name, right? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. If I can collect all of them. It's also not that bad. <laughs> all these quantum devices, and we're using pen and paper. Right? <laughs> yeah, I love that irony. Yeah. I mean, even one of our most complicated machines, we still use a pocket calculator every now and then to do some calculation on it. Even though like, it's the most expensive, a two million machine, and we still use a pocket calculator this, this next to it. Nice. It's uh, for our lithography. Yeah, no, we do have a... Yeah, no, it's a clear winner. Dorian H. Right, you've won. Right. Congratulations. Yeah. Come on up and uh, get your quantum prize. The, the exact thickness is 350, no, 35.39 nanometers. So we know on the subatomic level how thick that is. We could count the atoms and dangling bonds. All right, so uh, I have it in a black box. Uh, and there's a nice display with it. <laughs> Amazing. So here you go. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> And you, oh, actually, oh, we, we got to do photo op. <laughs> do I just, like, put it in the back?
put it out of the box. Oh, yeah, yeah maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So did you crunch the numbers, or did you, uh, was that a good guess? <laughs> Good guess. Good. It was a really good guess. Based on the aesthetic, you, you, you saw it for a little bit, and you guessed in the correct range. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah you touched it by the side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It was Dwayne, right? Uh, Dorian. Dorian, excuse me. Well, congratulations again to Dorian. Thanks. We're all envy your uh, beautiful <laughs> film. Uh, and uh, if you don't mind, if you want to stick around, we'll move to the back table where we can take a look at some of the uh, chips. Otherwise, uh, have a lovely day, and thanks for coming. Uh, I believe on uh, Thursday at 4 o'clock we have a tour of Qtex, uh, the, the two labs. Um, but that's unfortunately been sold out uh, for a long time now. So... Uh, if there's anyone particularly interested, maybe talk to me afterwards. I did see one cancellation come through this morning, so I might be able to sneak you in there. Otherwise, uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Roland. And thank you for my colleagues and uh, our videographers and photographers and to you, Delft Library staff. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm.